All right. We are live on YouTube and Rockfin with Rob Montz. And obviously, Rob, I must trust your ability to navigate the YouTube world because I don't do lives very often anymore for fear of violating the community guidelines because I focus on censored people and censored ideas, which is what we're talking about today. So you uh, run Good Kid Productions and you just produced this documentary a few months ago called Harvard Cancelled its best black professor. Why? Shall we listen to a minute or so before I let you kind yeah. of give us the rundown? Yeah, you're playing the you're playing the spiciest bit right now. <laughs> I'm a former TV reporter. We get right to it. So let's let go. Let's go. Okay. And if you can't hear it well, let me know. All right, here we go. And when he found some nonsense, he called it nonsense. Let's get past the bullshit because we can actually get this stuff done. It's not what to do. The question is, do we have the courage to do it? Roland's work represents a mortal threat to some of the most powerful black people at Harvard. Consider Claudine Gay, the daughter of an engineer who went from Exeter directly to Stanford, then to Harvard. She's a silky smooth corporate operator. Her signature accomplishment is a Harvard-wide inequality initiative. The world is awake to inequality and systemic racism and anti-Black racism in particular, really like never before. It's a standard array of task forces, symposiums, buzzwords promising equity and inclusion. Uh, a way of bringing this all together into, a, into an agenda that feels um, complementary and synergistic. Or take Larry Bobo, a man who regularly attacks Roland's work in his classroom. Bobo is the product of privilege, born to a physician in a cozy suburb of Nashville. A longtime professor of African American studies, Bobo has reached the coveted apex of his profession by doing this. Racism, racism, you see racism of racism, the terrible wound of slavery and attendant racism. This is the soft porn of black pain an empty, endless recitation of victimhood that gives ample moral pleasure to the audience, but actually accomplishes nothing for the kids Roland cares about. He's, He's not, not into, into the, the menstrual show. show. You gotta do this part. He's uh, more okay. likely to tell you something <laughs> like, you don't know a damn thing about what black people's problems are. And he's more likely to say that not only to you if you're white, but if you're one of these bow tie wearing domesticated Negroes who's never seen the inside of a housing project, he might tell you a little bit of something about that. He might tell you, you don't know what a crack house is. You ain't never been anywhere near where there's gunfire uh, crying out at two o'clock in the morning. You don't know where it came from. That's what he's likely to say. They don't like those kind of people at Harvard, I've noticed. <laughs> that guy is awesome. No, I wanted to stop it there for a second because I, I didn't want to I didn't want to forget that phrase that what was it the soft porn of black pain? Is that what he said? Yeah. Or you guys said? Yeah. Yeah, that's uh that's probably one of the more divisive uh, uh lyrical choices of mine throughout that, but I stand by it. I, I, so first off, I really enjoyed this and we'll play a couple more parts in a second. Uh, I highly recommend everybody go check it out. Again, Harvard canceled the best black professor why, and it's on uh, the Good Kid Productions channel on YouTube. And the link is in the comments. So you can go just click that and watch the whole thing. And um, it's it goes by fast. It's only 25 minutes, but it goes by fast. I thought it was really well produced. I have Thank some you. questions about, you know, any criticism you got of it and, and also just an update on uh, Professor Fryer. So let, let's go back since people may not know who Roland Fryer is. I know they could watch your documentary and get a lot out of that. Could you give us a sort of teaser version of, of what happened and why you decided to do a story about him? What they should know about him is, yeah, I mean, the what, the what I've taken to saying is that he's basically the black Goodwill hunting. So is that that famous late 90s Matt Damon movie about this kid born into a single uh, parent household in one of the economically depressed parts of Boston, who's just a crazy mathematical genius, kind of classic diamond in the rough. And Roland is very similar in that he was born into profound depravity and economic marginalization in a medium-sized city in Florida. Literally, like literally within hours of being born, he's abandoned by his mother, abandoned by her. 
and he's raised by an alcoholic dad with some uh, perpetual employment challenges. So he, Roland is essentially forced to raise himself. He doesn't meet his biological mother until he's 22 years old. The only person in the whole world who cares about him is his grandmother. And we'll get it, we get it later. Like there's a lot of his, his conversations with his grandmother end up informing his cutting edge genius economics work later on. So I mean, Roland kind of dabbles in small time crime in Texas where he, where he goes to high school, kind of trips and falls, stumbles into an economics course at the University of Texas and like instantly falls in love with the profession. In part because Roland is profoundly mathematically gifted, but also one of the core precepts of Ekfish, self-interested, <laughs> and are trying to maximize their own personal utility. That should be the operating assumption when you're trying to dissect and analyze the world, right? And Roland's like, that fits quite nicely with my personal experience. Most people are, uh, most people are self-interested. But on top of that, like when you talk about applied economics, I think economics, sometimes people think of this kind of, it's this distant ivory tower, I guess like kind of masturbatory exercise of irrelevant equations. Applied economics, which is where Roland makes his bones, is about trying to take those equations and apply them to the world to crack open the world to kind of reveal new hidden truths about the way things operate. And Roland falls in love with economics because there, it brings life into order and into focus in a way that his life up to that point has been pure chaos. And we can get into how we, from that to where the story starts, but essentially this unwanted kid, this abandoned boy who was on multiple times at great risk of falling into like the drug trade, powers himself to be the youngest black professor to ever receive tenure at Harvard University. So he's nine years younger than me. He's a full tenured professor at Harvard. And within a matter of just a couple of years after that, he wins something called the Clark Medal, which basically means you are the best economist in the world under 40 years old. So the most unlikely of sex, uh, success stories, as you can imagine, right? And then, you, I mean, I'll break for a question. I don't want to monologue too much. But he basically, a series of events transpires that leads to his cancellation. Mm -hmm. And our documentary investigates some of the dark mechanics behind that cancellation. Right. Okay. And I, I'll show an article or two about what the mainstream headlines were since that's my my background is mainstream corporate news they kind of just jumped on that he was he was uh investigated for sexual harassment basically and that's what everybody kind of ran with your documentary looks at it from a very different angle one of which is the kind of professor that Roland Fryer is and his education lab and how how he was trying to teach in a different style that promoted people thinking differently and being able to take intellectual risks, which is very, I think, anathema in some cases, a lot of cases now at Harvard. We were talking before we went live about how when I went to seminary in Boston, we could trade schools all the time. You could, you could go to any of the Boston schools that belong to this consortium. So I went to Harvard a lot. But even, you know, there or Boston University where I graduated from, I, I already had sense that there were certain questions you just could not ask, certain discussions you couldn't have. And in my mind, even if, say, you you totally bought into the ideology of what you were being taught, I never really quite understood why the purveyors of those wouldn't want you to, as somebody who didn't really quite understand it or was critical of it, why they wouldn't want you to feel comfortable speaking up because how else would you like learn? How would you, how would they evangelize you? I guess, really, if you didn't feel comfortable being able to discuss it. So even if you were somebody who really bought into it, it seemed like it would make more sense to have an, an atmosphere where people could take intellectual risks because how else are you supposed to talk to them about, about, you right. know, moving them to your side. But you guys talk about, about Professor Fryer as a guy who, who really didn't even, didn't want to do it for that reason to like push people into some, box but actually to really get to the truth like there's a quote from him where he says the truth is all that matters like just getting to the truth is all that matters regardless of the consequence that that's that that's the important part so can you describe that that ethos a little bit and what he was trying to do with his education lab and then how that 
how that's associated with his cancellation. Well, again, it's the truth is actually not the end in itself. The truth is the means towards rescuing all the poor black people he left behind. Right. That's extremely important. It's not about mindless provocation. It's not about pissing people off. It's not about making white observers happy or conservatives or libertarians or Republicans. It's not about it's not about, it's if you want to reduce these yawning gaps between black and white people in America and education or professional accomplishment or in economics, which is exactly what Roland decides to devote his life to, closing those gaps, your policy interventions have to be linked to the truth. So I, like that's like obvious to say, but it's kind of it's kind of a problematic thing to say at Harvard. You have to they have to be, or else they're not gonna work, or else they're not gonna work, right? They're not gonna work. Right. So he's like, I care about the truth because I care about crafting policy solutions that actually make a difference in people's lives, as opposed to superficial virtue signaling that actually makes no difference whatsoever on the south side of Chicago or on Dayton, Florida, mm. right? Or in or in you know, small town Texas. So that's why he cares about the truth. And it's evident. So what he does, though, is he basically takes his genius economics brain. He identifies the most hot button, high pressure, highly cancelable questions in American political discourse. And he dives like directly into them. He's like, yo, what's the actual truth behind this hotly debated subject? And Can I don't want to give us a couple examples, yeah. Rob. Of, Let me give you some the best one to give you is the one that made national news was he looked into whether or not there was racial bias in the Houston Police Department, right? This is after the advent of Black Lives Matter, but before the grand uh, racial reckoning of the summer of 2020. He's like, yo, let's find out, like, are unarmed Black men being shot and killed disproportionately by racist police officers in Houston? And he does this extremely intense and time-consuming investigation into the Houston Police Department. And again, I want to say that he has two major findings. Not, the, the, combined, the, the combination of which does not feed, fit any neat political narrative, right? Which should tell you something about this guy. He's not about advancing a particular partisan agenda. He does actually find that black versus white suspects are roughed up and physically kind of messed with at a much higher rate by police officers, black suspects are than white suspects, even if the suspect is uh, identified as compliant by the police officer themselves, right? Again, we don't, but he's like, even compliant black suspects are more likely to be sort of tased or handcuffed or patted down than white suspects. Why exactly that is, we don't know, but that's certainly not like a, a, a neat Fox News talking point. The thing that got him in trouble is, he found out there actually was no racial bias in police shootings. He found that black suspects were actually slightly less likely to be shot than white suspects in Houston. And he later said it was the most surprising result of his entire career. I mean, what should intrigue people is he does that. It makes national news. It gets quoted by all sorts of problematic conservative figures, <laughs> right? As evidence that Black Lives Matter is built on a lie. And then within six months, what goes down to end his career goes down. Like the timing is mad suspect. And we can, you know, if you want to get into it, what exactly happened to him. But that part of that, that sequence of events is what led me to be intrigued by this case in the first place. Right. It's like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. it, that's awfully suspect that, that suddenly once he starts using his genius to unearth problematic truths, that's when this kind of dark machinery of Title IX sexual harassment gets kicked in. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so this is something that um, a lot of people, like a headline example that a lot of people will see. Um, it says, Harvard restores Professor Fryer's teaching research roles after two years sexual harassment suspension. And this is the Harvard paper itself, but they basically talk about the guy was um, investigated and it was found that he committed verbal sexual harassment against several female staffers and fostered a hostile work environment in his former lab. That uh, the Crimson reported in 2018, Fryer was a subject of at least four Harvard led investigations, including one into his spending and the lab's finances. Uh, 
now they do say that one of these was like later withdrawn. A former female employee of a friars also filed a separate complaint with the Massachusetts commission against discrimination that was later withdrawn. Uh, then they talk about these complainants alleged that he'd engaged in sexual misconduct for years, fostered a hostile environment for women. I mean, it's pretty bad. They, they shut down the lab. Uh, and basically the crimson just goes in. That's all they say. They don't it's talk about it. Yeah. Well, you notice so they don't mention any of the specific things he was found guilty of. Right. So, okay. So let's talk about your, let's talk about your, um, your documentary again and what, 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 what happened with the investigation specifically? Um, I don't want to spoil all of it because I want to intrigue <laughs> but Well, generally speaking. <laughs> I, I would say this. I would say this. Um, part of the way he designs the culture of the lab is to make it not a safe corporate place that is just a hues to the ideological guards that are put upon you if you're a professor at Harvard University, particularly if you're a black professor, in terms of what's expected of you in terms of the questions you ask and the answers that you find. He doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to blind himself with ideology and he wants to stay brave. And even as the his profile raises, he wants to continue to ask the maximally provocative questions because those are the questions necessary to dig up the truth that I can actually can make a difference in the lives of individual black peoples, black people, right? So the people that don't live in Cambridge, <laughs> that actually might need some help, and they don't need sympathy, they don't need uh, they don't need Black Lives Matter uh, yard signs. So within that, the culture he cultivates is extremely free flowing. It purposely, we talk about in the documentary, he would regularly play stand-up sets from the most controversial black comedians and, and, and would have his research team draw inspiration from some of the questions that these comedians asked. Because the uh, comedian, because of the nature of the medium, it tend to give him free reign to go into those dark places you're not supposed to discuss in polite society. And that is exactly what Roland wants to do with his economics research, right? What are these dark corners? What are these questions that are not politically correct? Those are, ex those are exactly the questions that I want to ask, right? And again, as part of that intentional effort to cultivate a transgressive, free-flowing culture, um, Roland refuses to code switch. Let me explain what that means. It's like he refuses to stop being that poor, lower middle class, black kid from Florida, right? He's not from Exeter. He didn't get a PhD from MIT. He went to a state school. He's not buttoned up. He doesn't wear Brooks Brothers. He doesn't golf, right? He loves, uh, yeah, I mean, he doesn't golf. Roland doesn't golf. And <laughs> he wants to be his authentic self, both because he doesn't, he refuses to sort of buckle to the suffocating expectations of Harvard University, but also by being himself, it, it means he's going to bump up against these artificial guardrails of what kind of research he's allowed to pursue. And I think the things that he f are, is found guilty of, the things that are actually proven about him is occasionally he might have gone over the line in terms of how much transgression he cultivated in the lab, right? Like there are things that are jokes that are completely reasonable for a lower middle class black kid who's like working at a construction site to say that maybe are not appropriate if you're the Clark medal winning world-class economist and many of the people that work for you, their entire professional futures are in your, are in your hands. There's ways in which that power asymmetry does mean you have to conform to some standard rules of politeness and he just kind of violates them. Now, I think the real kicker is Harvard's own investigators, the, the Title IX investigators, basically the Title IX is the office that investigates sexual harassment complaints. They reach their conclusions. They find him guilty of like, I think it's it's less than a dozen instances of sexual harassment. What they recommend is training. So Harvard's mm. own Title IX investigators recommend training. That somehow gets transformed into essentially career termination. And we also go into 
well, what, what, what path did that travel to get to the point that you're basically rendering this guy radioactive in his profession? Okay, let's play this part and um, we'll discuss. Let me know if you can't hear it. Do you worry about that also, though, like even appearing in this? I think that there is a real risk, but I think um, what I've been thinking about a lot lately also is there's a risk to saying nothing at all and to look back on something and to realize that you should have said something, but you didn't just because you didn't have the words at the time. And maybe you have the words now, but the words aren't useful now. Like, how could you be doing such important work dedicating so much time and energy to helping people and have this be the, the end result. I, I think that was really disheartening. So, I mean, what happened to Roland Fryer? We know that it was not manslaughter. Like it was murder, like it was intentional. And it was perpetrated by people who did not take kindly to his rigorous slaughter of their precious ideological codes. People who got gifted some superior weaponry and used it to snuff him out. It's, it's ridiculous, ridiculous that I'm the person that has to say this, but they're willing to enforce these ideological codes even if it means sacrificing the future of those boys and those girls. Okay. okay. I want to stop right there real fast. So that was a student, right? One of uh, Roland Fryer's students that was talking before you. And he was saying how there is risk to being a part of this documentary. And then you're talking about this is not manslaughter. This is murder. This is directed. Now, one question I got from my audience ahead of time over on Locals, which I'll show everybody, go over to alicemorrow.locals.com and be part of my editorial board so you can pose questions for people like Rob ahead of time, uh, was if that's all true, you know, you have a student that takes a, a risk, you have you guys making the case that this was, you know, intentional murder, that's what you're saying, of the guy's career. But then he comes back and apologizes. And I'll show the quote um, in a second. But I got a couple questions about why, you know, if 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 it was so unjustified the way that um, you guys build the case for, her, why would Fryer say, I apologize for the insensitive and inappropriate comments that led to my suspension, which I regret deeply and which brought shame on the department and disrepute on me personally? I didn't appreciate the inherent power dynamics in my interactions, which led me to act in ways that I now realize were deeply inappropriate for someone in my position. So he's essentially saying like, okay, yeah, I guess I was wrong and I shouldn't have done it. And he apologized. Um, so does that, does that put any holes in the case that you guys were trying to make? And is it also, I guess, put at risk the people who are willing to stand up for him in the documentary? I mean, like, I don't want that's the, I don't want to overstate it, but like, why did people apologize for being insufficiently revolutionary in like the court of Stalin? Right? It's like it's a forced confession. <laughs> it's coerced out of him. It's like, but why do you like, think he wouldn't? Why do you think I, Rob he wouldn't just say screw you, Harvard? I'll go work somewhere else. I mean, why did he? I mean, why part did of he it go is running back. I mean, so and as we get into the documentary, so he tenured basically means he's guaranteed a job for life. And we looked into it and, and Harvard had not revoked the tenure, which is what you'd have to do to fire a tenured professor one time in the last hundred years. It just does not happen. So effectively, that was not an option for some of the um, the enemies of Roland Fryer that perpetrated this, this, this grave injustice. But the punishment they level on him is the worst possible thing you can do outside of revocation of tenure. Just if they suspended him from campus for two years, he has to have, he's under Title IX surveillance once he steps foot back on campus. They liquidated his lab. Glenn Lowry recently told me that Harvard still has $30 million that Roland raised in a bank account that Roland cannot touch. They shut down his laboratory. They fired everybody. They shut down all his research operations. And he can protest his innocence as much as he'd like. I mean, even being subjected to a Title IX inquisition 
is extremely bad for your career and hyper stigmatizes you and makes it very difficult for you to get hired anywhere else to be on the receiving end of, of like nuclear weaponry, like Harvard's best nuclear weaponry means you can't get a job anywhere else. It's impossible. You can't get hired anywhere else. So he can quit, you really but then he's like, he's like, oh, he's going back to like, he's going back to McDonald's. Like there's, 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 there's no job for him in the economics profession. If he voluntarily you really think that nowadays, you think that really nowadays that there that universities are still playing that game because I feel like some are really starting to wake up to uh, to this idea of of how bad academics have gotten and are are taking in professors like that. I mean, I I like what Hillsdale's doing. I like what the University of Austin is doing, but they there's still you know. You can leave Harvard, but you don't want to leave and sacrifice 99% of the, the, the cultural cachet of having that on your resume, which is what you do if you leave Harvard to go to the University of Austin. Hopefully that changes. Hopefully kind of the voluntary, sustained, scandalous brand a desecration of Harvard University, self-imposed desecration of Harvard's brand. Well, and then and in turn... Places like University of Austin, Hillsdale, or like the Hoover Institution at Stanford, them continuing mm. to collect all these just world-class brains. It resets the public perception in terms of where the prestige is. But at this point, the asymmetry is too large. That's my impression. I I, I, mm. I don't I, I do not know. I do not obviously I don't know. Roland is not in this. Roland did I did not interview Roland for this. You I, I don't know. That's my best guess though. Yeah. Well, and so that brings up two questions I have. Yeah. So one is why isn't Roland in it? But number two, uh you know, can, can that balance change without people leading it to move, <laughs> to change it? I mean, it's, you know, it, it, at some point, you know, it doesn't change unless there are people willing to walk away and, and tip the scale in the opposite direction. So if they keep going back to the university that, that, you know, in, in your argument, beat the crap out of them, then like the system just never changes until enough people, I mean, at some point it just, it was just, all it requires is enough people to just say, I'm, I'm just not going to participate in this craziness. Um, I mean, I totally understand the factors you're talking about too. And having gone to school way too long, I know many, many people that, you know, yeah, they feel like their entire identity would be completely cracked if they were to leave their tenured position at a, you know, a prestigious university. But I don't know if, if what you're, I guess, if you're about resisting that kind of culture just seems like, I don't know. Maybe he would say, I feel like I could do more there than, than gone. I, I, you know, some people like wouldn't leave TV news. Like I did. They'd say, I, I, I'm going to stay in TV news. Cause I feel like it can make a difference. I, I, I left cause I didn't think you could change the system. So I was like, I'm not, I'm out of here. I'm going to create something new, but that's, that's just another side question. But really why, why wasn't rolling in it? Did you reach out to him? Actually that, uh, uh, he didn't do it. Um, from what I can tell. And again, this is limited information. Um, is, uh, he was worried about further retaliation, <laughs> right? Like, and, and it's like, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm telling you, man, it's like, you know, Harvard runs a $60 billion hedge fund <laughs> and is the supreme status allocator in a lot of American life and is stocked full of, uh, of geniuses. <laughs> and he, uh, He's he already felt the brunt of some of its um, some of its weaponry, and I think he was worried about uh, attempting fate by continuing to kind of poke at old wounds. It's interesting you bring up media, though. This is semi-related. I don't actually think that asymmetry we talked about in academia is the same as it is in media. My sense is, from both the cultural cachet and just raw size of the audience. It is not as big of a deal to leave CNN just to start your own YouTube channel because CNN has collapsing user confidence, <laughs> yeah, has collapsing true. brand equity. CNN Plus was a, a catastrophic, you know, $100 million failure. And it's like, would you, I mean, would you rather go on CNN primetime or go rather go on Joe Rogan? It's like you'd rather go right. on Joe Rogan in terms of both raw viewership and also quality of those views. In media, at least, that asymmetry is changing. I mean, a lot of the essential, um, you know, 
assumptions of our business and the channel we're building and the media company that we're building is that exactly like, mm -hmm. and I've seen, I mean, like Harvard has a YouTube channel. Uh, like they've they, they've never made anything that's even a fraction as good as this documentary, I, and they I barely made anything that has ratios. a bigger audience. I, you know? I'd love it, to go see the ratios on their videos. It, I mean, it's <laughs> it's it's quite it's quite not a lot of people want to watch ninety minute lectures from anthropology professors talking about how colonialism, you know, whatever is the is the foundation of American capitalism. It's like not that it's it, not not a lot of user engagement. So I'm saying on the media side, we actually, you can compete independently. You can get mm -hmm. huge, rabid audiences because these other institutions have gotten like lazy and lame and ideologically corrupted. Well, that's not true. The but it's the academy. It's just not that, yet. Yeah, but if you, but see, you're an outsider, right? I mean, you never worked in the industry, did you? Because I have lots of friends who won't leave for the reason that you described people don't want to leave Harvard. Their whole identity is wrapped up in being in that brand and that logo. So we on the outside, we see it. We we totally see what you just said, and I agree with you. But the insiders who are still working it, they they do really believe that that's that's the that's Why? the pinnacle. You know, Bro, like who watches those shows? Who watches? Still, I mean, I don't know what. Like who watches? Their, like, they don't like, care. More people like and watch care. my stuff than there's theirs. Like I, we're just a couple of rebels in Richmond, and we we can compete at that level. Not everything it's does, but like. Well, yeah, but it's because it's not really about, it's not really about facts and numbers and that kind of thing. You know, it's just not, it, it's an identity thing. It's a psychological. It's lame. That's not I a way know. to live. It's, it's, an, it's, like, it's, it's just, like, just like you would see Harvard that way. I'm Liberate just telling you how they think. What'd you say? Make, make, make your sense of identity uh, earned personal success. Not because some institution deigns. But see, you're making you the case for why more. someone should leave Harvard. Okay, wait, but before you go any farther, okay. One thing that's got amazing brand identity and is not cracking is allisonwinepromo.com. And definitely if you're getting canceled at your university, you need something good to drink. So you should go get 50% off these amazing Malbecs from Argentina and 50% off shipping and support my work while you're at it. There is the rogue Malbec. There's no better Malbec to describe what we're discussing today. So we'll get that in honor of the film that we're talking about and uh, also go check out the film again. We'll give another shout out in a second. There's one from almost 9,000 feet. It's a high altitude Malbec and the Gaucho Malbec, the Cowboy Malbec. So go check them out. You can't get them at a grocery store. You can support my work. Again, you get 50% off the wine itself and 50% off shipping. If you're a coffee or tea drinker, though, you can go to twininginecoffee.com slash Allison and check out a wide variety of organic Nicaraguan roasts or a Keturah tea. Uh, there's a limited black edition, which is dark roast, which I really like. There's uh, the cigar number one is also a dark roast. But the Keturah tea, if you like tea, it's like a black tea. It's actually the fruit around the coffee bean. I cold brew mine 24 hours. You can hopper it. It's also very good. So twininginecoffee.com slash Allison, allisonwinepromo.com. Okay, so let's go back real fast to um, to this discussion we were having about why he didn't leave. And um, because I want to go over to locals real fast. This is where people put in questions ahead of time. And this is kind of apropos. I mean, you've, 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 answered a lot of, of what this person was asking about. Um, one, only one of his students was brave enough to speak in his defense. What a disgrace and lack of loyalty, but then asking the question about, um, you know, his apology and, and, you know, kind of the, the question I already sort of posed about if, if he, you know, if he really believed in his ideas, why would he apologize? And um, I think, you know, you already kind of explained, but they're asking the other questions are, how is this film being promoted to reach your target audience? And who is the main audience that you want to reach? Um, uh, I don't know about our main audience, just humanity. There's actually another person that worked with him that's in the documentary as well. That's an essential part of the storytelling. Um, her name's Tanai Devi. There were probably, yeah, maybe a couple dozen other people that I talked with on the record that advanced my understanding of things, but just would not come on camera. Because again, like if you come on camera, like the Death Star is going to turn its laser beams on you. <laughs> and I, I can't, I can't necessarily blame them. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's easy to talk tough when Harvard can't do anything to you like it is for us, but it's hard if, particularly if you're a graduate student or if you're an aspiring academic and the, 
the academic job market is just, um, it's such a, it's so uh, exploitative and it's very easy to manipulate because it's mostly not based upon merit. It's based upon kind of perception and clickishness and political tribalism that it's very easy to ruin someone's career and snuff it out quickly if they are not sufficiently royal, uh, loyal to the Death Star. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Frankly, I've been very surprised with how well this documentary is done. I mean, we did our best to try to build it as a story that could be interesting to people of all political stripes and of all ages. But, you know, some of my team were worried. This documentary is about a professor that people have never heard of. Some of it's like technical economics, like like uh, applied economics doesn't exactly go um, viral on a regular basis, <laughs> social media, right? And people don't know who this guy is. The case itself was not well covered. And I mean, it's been awesome to see the reception because then it means that we had the right idea, that there's something in our instincts that was correct. My instincts have also been wrong about other topics. So I'm not like, you know, but it's a, there's the, 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 the political persuasion and the age and the race of many of the people that have loved this documentary is, has been extraordinarily diverse and has been, has been surprising. So I don't know. I mean, I don't, as far as target audience, we honestly don't think about it that much. We probably should think about it some more. I'm just trying to grow our channel and make the most baller stuff that I could think back on fondly on my deathbed. That's it. That's it. <laughs> um, okay. Let's go back. It was actually another person that asked that question. The film gave a rather strong impression that Roland was punished for something other than what he was accused of. Did Roland sacrifice his personal integrity in order to keep what remains of his position at Harvard, can he be again the man he was three years ago? Well, I, I get into this. I wrote a long piece for Quillette about what he's up to now. So he is back at Harvard. He's technically still a professor there. But his, as far as I've been able to tell, his involvement with campus is minimal. That he got relegated to teaching like a like a freshman introductions to economics course. It's like this Clark Medal winning once in a generation genius economist is teaching a bunch of like dorky 19 year olds about supply curves. So they're just like relegating him to like the most irrelevant position on the campus. Right. But while he was suspended, because this dude is incredible, he went out and raised tons of money and started his own venture fund. So he's continuing to do the work that he was trying to accomplish in, in the academy, but now in the private market, mm -hmm. he has, um, it's called equal opportunity ventures and they are, they put angel investments into startups that have the same aim and goal of his economics research, which is about substantively improving the lives of black people. It's about Roland is constantly thinking about all the other young Rolands that he left behind during this like mythic ascension into the very highest realms of the Academy. And he has not forgotten where he came from. He's not forgotten about those people. And he's like continued to devote his life and his genius to improving their lives substantially. So his, his, his venture fund finances companies that are attempting to accomplish the same thing as the cutting edge economics that he was engaged in before, before his industrial strength cancellation. So he hasn't given okay, up. One, one thing I thought of back to our conversation when you were like, saying that media folks are different than academics and they should just get a new identity. It's stupid to think that you're some kind of baller because you work for NBC. Think about how many articles you've seen where the mainstream outlet believes that people who are doing, you know, journalism or even just giving their thoughts outside of that, that infrastructure are not not contributing to the conversation, but are are untrustworthy sources of disinformation and how really they've been some of the loudest voices to cancel the independence because they see themselves really as the purveyor of truth for no other reason other than the fact that they work at these outlets. And even though they regularly have to retract their articles, they have bad sources. They ha are wrong, just flat out wrong. Somehow they still feel like they, you know, they deserve the higher privilege than the independents. And like I said earlier, the only way I know how to make sense of it is just some kind of psycho spiritual issue. But 
but they they do. I mean, you could see that reflected in in the work of a lot of journalists. Like Taylor Lorenz is constantly right trying to cancel people on the outside. She's, her so, life is a nightmare. She deserves nothing but pity. Who cares what these like mediocre lame? But I'm just telling think? you, they do see themselves very similar to the way you described. I don't care. I don't have to ask for their permission. I don't care. All we're going to do is make the most baller stuff possible. And if it does well, I'm I get to talk to lovely people you to ask, like you. I'm not asking you to ask permission. I'm just trying yeah. to tell you that I think, you know, when you're talking about why wouldn't, why are people too scared to leave academics and saying, well, it's just different than media. I, I just, dis, I guess I disagree. Yeah. Um, I, I just disagree. I, I see what you're saying. I guess one, one, one point, I guess I'll, I'll um, agree with is, you know, if you're going to, if you want that university type job, you're right that there's probably, it's probably harder to start like an online teaching uh, outlet, yeah. you know, something like that and, and like make it work. I, I, I could see that. Then it would be to go from NBC to like YouTube, right. And make that work. I can, I can see how, and just start doing media analysis or what you guys are doing that that's probably easier to do independently than teaching is. That said, like, you know, at the end of the day, I guess I ultimately think that if you're going to be somebody who wants to change a system, you know, and you have, you know, you're, you, you end up in the crosshairs of it, but you go back to it. I just, I don't know. I, I, I guess I, 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 I just have questions about that. Not, not criticisms, just questions about how, how you change it. If, if we don't have more people jump ship, that's all. I mean, Again, I'm going to talk wild shit because that's just my personality, but let's also not overstate my expertise here, right? Like our, our we have a 6,000 person sub base. Like it's not exactly like we've taken over the world. We're trying. <laughs> I mean, we've had a couple documentaries that have broken through and got a, have gotten insane earned media attention, but we've also done stuff that has gone nowhere. So I'm still trying to figure it out. I might be a moron, but it, but I like, I, I see what those legacy institutions are generating and I, at best, I think it's intellectually hollow and boring and completely devoid of any artistic merit. Mm -hmm. At worst, it's actively propagandistic. Like we have a oh, couple yeah. different videos that are in the crock pot right now. And one of them is a large project of the same size, scope, production values as Roland Project. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to, it's about a very famous news item from the last couple of years that has not been deconstructed yet, but that news item represented like it's very difficult to call it anything other than like a coordinated propagandistic conspiracy to actively misrep misrepresent reality conducted uh -huh. by every major legacy media institution of the country. Right. <laughs> I know you well, start you sounding crazy. I mean, I, no, I don't want to be, I don't want to be so. some crazy guy, but like trust me, this thing that we're, we're delving into, there is no other way to discuss it. Other than it was it was coordinated propaganda to conspiracy by all these completely mediocre mm -hmm. slash ideologically corrupted legacy media institutions, mm -hmm. right? And so yeah. we um we uh we're we're going to but part of what we're also this is just and then I'll is for these stories that get shoved into prefab progressive narratives, they get shoved in. The second that the particular facts of the matter start to indicate that they weren't what you're told they are, the media just abandons them and moves on, right? So the legacy, mm -hmm. legacy institutions want to take these things, the people that are involved, squeeze them for all the ratings and moral self-satisfaction they can get out of them. And the second mm -hmm. that they don't have any use for them anymore, they abandon them, right? Mm -hmm. And there are right. ways that there, there's a very particular in this, this story that we're telling there are people that get left behind and that are damaged and that are abandoned by this mm -hmm. process that do not get discussed that mm -hmm. never get talked about. And we'll, we're going to, and we're going to, we're going to talk about them. We're going to talk about it. Well, you'll have to come back on when that's out. Cause I would love to discuss that. Yeah, of course. All right. Um, back to locals. I enjoyed this documentary very much. It is like a literal microcosm of my life. In the 1950s, black people encouraged each other to be twice as good as their white peers. But by the 1970s, the acting white mess came in along with all the entrapments of the welfare state. How many venues have turned down your film or pushed back on your efforts to have it seen? I mean, none that I know. I mean, our, we, I mean, just, I got my start as a contractor or a filmmaker for other channels, mostly in like the libertarian space in my twenties and early thirties. So uh, reason TV 
uh, which is the Reason Reason Magazine, and they were one of the first big YouTube channels. I did a lot of work for them. There's Capital Research Center, some other places that I've I've made videos for, and the the We the Internet. My very first video that I did with Glenn Lowry, who people saw at the very beginning, was on a documentary about my alma mater, Brown University, to the this free speech crisis that was overtaking that institution in 2013, 2014. And interviewing Glenn for that is how I met him. And he and I have collaborated a bunch of times since, which is like wonderful because he's the most uh, powerful public speaker in the English speaking world, which is nice to know. It's nice, nice to have that person be in your films every once in a while. He's like yeah. the Daniel Day Lewis, but of documentaries. And he, um, but the success of some of the stuff we've done gave us the opportunity to start our own channel. Mm -hmm. And this is basically, it's been a, it's been like maybe 14, 15 months. We're basically the, the role in documentary was the end of our first season of starting our own channel. And so we had maybe five or six mini docs. Roland is the best one, but we've, we've done one about um, how Kanye West's run for president in 2020 was not crazy. He actually is the ultimate agent of anti-wokeness. We also did weird stuff about like um, the, 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 the philosophical, technology and stoic genius of Ulysses S. Grant. That one didn't exactly take the internet by storm, but I'm just obsessed with Ulysses Grant and I find him to be a uh, perpetual source of inspiration. We have some other stuff as well. So it's a combination of big hyper-produced documentaries like Roland. And then we also have a kind of interview show where I'll just interview people that I think are interesting. And we, so we've gotten the opportunity to build up. So the idea for this was never to pitch it with anybody else. Our whole idea was we want to tackle these subjects that we personally find compelling, delve into maximally provocative issues, have this kind of conservative libertarian critique of woke legacy propag media propaganda, but have it with production values that are as good or better than what you find on Netflix, which as far as we can tell does not exist in the market. That is like, that is a market niche. Now, is there a sufficient customer base to sustain a business that operates within that market niche? We're going to find out. I hope so. I got three kids in, in property, so I, it better work out. I don't know. I hope so, Allison. But and you that, live on I 50 did. acres. You live and on so 50 like, acres and have rabbits. We, we got rabbits in 50 <laughs> acres, and I got three young humans. And they're not at, yet at the point where they can pay their own way through their labor. So I, daddy's got to do it. That And, and right. they're being homeschooled. So I got to do it. <laughs> Uh, but I would say I, so far, I think the, you were just saying that um, I think also, though, leaving legacy institutions, there is a large, deeply frustrated, unsatisfied kind of centrist customer base for media in this country. Oh, sure. I, my, my, this, this documentary got covered by Barry Weiss's Substack, who I'd imagine a lot of mm -hmm. your people, it's not Barry Weiss. And her mm -hmm. whole, she's written a very good essay about trying to feed this exhausted middle and it's basically centrist it's not particularly conservative um or or even even right wing but it's people that you know are in the middle and that rightfully feel deeply alienated from the legacy institutions that have just constantly beclowned themselves particularly over the last couple of years and it's in terms of the reception for this documentary it's been a vindication of that instinct that there are a lot of people that don't want to watch cnn or msnbc they don't watch stephen colbert they they think this stuff is lame or boring or predictable or ideologically co-opted. And they're desperate for stuff that is visually and aesthetically dynamic and there's really elite craftsmanship of storytelling, but also like have like a really beautiful soundtrack and you shoot stuff with really beautiful cameras. So like that is that's what we're that's the that's the niche that we're attempting we're attempting to fill. Okay. Um I wanted to somebody sorry I'm I know I'm not on the screen right now give me a second here <laughs> I'm trying to pull this up somebody in the chat suggested looking into this guy if you're interested in canceled professors this is another free speech I guess issue or uh, maybe it's not he's NYU which is a state school so maybe it, it does make a difference but the article says that he taught a section of his this is a uh, Mark Crispin Miller NYU propaganda yeah, I know, class. I know yeah you know okay so you know the story here yeah Okay. Well, for people who don't, the class was uh, promoting, was focusing on campaigns promoting mask wearing as a means of limiting the spread of COVID. 
And a student took issue with some of his statements and went to Twitter, called for him to be fired. And um, I'm not totally sure all that happened here because this is brand new to me. So I guess I will have to read through the article. But anyway, that was one suggestion. Another idea I have for you, if you're just interested in like, I don't know, just making connections with professors who don't give a shit is, <laughs> and then seeing where it takes you, is Dave Collum. I don't know if you know him. He's at Cornell. He's a tenured pro professor at Cornell, and he's a chemistry professor, but he's like, like, for instance, one of the things, and Susan Wojcicki at YouTube will probably strike me for this, but one of the things I thought was so interesting is that he was talking about, like, climate change and how his opinions on that went from very just institutional homogenous the way that all professors are taught to think about it at these Ivy league schools to, I will, I guess I won't just totally say it here uh, and give it away, but like, he's got a very different opinion after just reading through tons of research. And he just talks about stuff that I, I think I'm shocked. He still has his job. I mean, I guess it's because he's tenured, but I'm, I'm shocked yeah. that he hasn't had more people come after him and he's very vocal on Twitter and social media and stuff. So if you're looking for another professor, Dave Collins also really good. Um, just, just if you're making connections in that world of cancellation and speech and stuff like that. So, okay. Uh, kind of just like two more questions on locals. Let me go back to this real fast here. Um, this was fantastic. Wow. And I do have to say, Rob, you guys did like, whether people agree or disagree, I feel like they have to give you props for the way you put it together. Cause it is, it keeps your attention and it really does tell the story of a guy who like you would otherwise maybe not care about you. I, there's so many things about him that I think draw the viewer in. So you guys just did a good job telling that story. Um, were you mm -hmm. convinced by Dr. Fryer's economic arguments or do you have an opinion of them? I mean, I only know the stuff that we cover. I mean, in terms of like, if, if, if well, uh, part of it's like, who cares if I'm convinced? Like if, 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 if Professor Roland Flat Fryer, the Harvard economist, Clark Medal winner, and I, Rob Montz, the undergraduate philosophy degree major, disagree on some piece of economic wisdom, you should not care what I think. You should, you should just do whatever he says. You should defer to his opinions, right? I mean, it was really interesting. It's actually funny. Um, Thank you for the compliment. The one part that I've been also pleasantly surprised by is we, we there's that section about his, his his work in education, right? And which is extremely important. Like that was basically where Roland really made his bones is he's like, school is the engine of, could be the engine of economic uplift for my people. But I look around and all these schools that are educating young black kids just like suck, right? There's horrible. This is like a, it's an incredible, it's like, a, it's like a, it's like a new civil rights violation, just how garbage these schools are. And so he's like, okay, I'm at Harvard. Um, we're told constantly, the common sense position is the way to improve educational outcomes for poor black kids in these schools is to spend more money per pupil. It's to, I think it's to reduce, um, it's more money per pupil, more credentials, for teachers, or it's, I think it's reducing class sizes might be the third one. And he goes and looks at the literature and it's now become like decades of economic literature indicate none of those things make a difference. They're absolutely irrelevant. And actually the um, larding up teachers with more credentials oddly has a negative correlation to educational outcomes. So the more master's degrees in education studies your history teacher has, the more likely they are to fail you. <laughs> so he found out. So it's like, okay, the standard issue set of solutions do not work. What does work, right? And so he goes and he he goes and he investigates this place called the Harlem Children's Zone. And we don't need to get into the specifics, but basically what he's trying to do is the Harlem Children's Zone takes in only poor black kids and somehow gets them to outperform their white peers at even at, at richer schools. It's unbelievable, right? And Roland's like, what are they doing? And he's trying to be, he's like, he's acting kind of like a medical scientist. He's trying to go in and figure out, they've discovered the vaccine for education. What are the core chemical elements of that vaccine? So what is it that the Harlem Children's Zone does that other schools do not do? And could we identify those core chemical elements and then extract it and inject it into other school systems. I was, when we were putting this together, I find education policy very interesting, but mm -hmm. you know, we're a little bit worried if people are going to be bored by it. And it's been, it's been pleasantly surprising to see that people do 
find it interesting. And also that, that whole section is told with interlaced between me narrating it and then Roland talking. And he's basically stand-up level comedian entertaining. So he he's also very good at making these kind of dry policy matters super entertaining for a broader audience. So we kind of had that as a storytelling asset as we're putting it together. And so he he goes to the Harlem Children's Zone and he extracts this five-part formula. And if people want the specifics, they should just watch the doc. But one of those is a culture of high expectations, which is a deeply, it runs directly against woke orthodoxy, where woke orthodoxy says, if you come from a, a disadvantaged background and standardized tests are showing that you're behind your white peers, the tests must be somehow white supremacist. Whereas the Harlem Children's Zone says, I, why, if you come from a, a single parent from some rough part of one of the kind of far flung New York City boroughs, sorry for you, that's bad luck. But like now we're going to teach you algebra. Like that's just, we, we don't take excuses here and we don't condescend to you because of your rough childhood conditions. And that's one of the essential elements of this, of the zone success. Mm -hmm. I remember that exchange that you have in the documentary between Roland Fryer and that guy from wired, I think the wire. Yeah. And so, and he's white and Fryer's black. And I believe the argument that the wired guy was making was like, you just can't get past the fact that black kids feel bad about themselves because they've been told to feel bad about themselves. And Friar's like, why, why don't we try, <laughs> you know, why don't we just try something? And it was yeah. just, it's, it was fascinating to see like the white guy say, no, it can't be done. And the black guy's like, wait a second, what? Like, you know, no. like, I, you know, like my your pity, that event takes place in Martha's vineyard. He's like the pity and the condescension of some yeah. millionaire Hollywood white guy isn't going to help a goddamn person in Daytona, Florida. It's not going to help anyone. It, it, it advances what, no causes. It helps their life. Not one iota. And just Roland has no Brown, to that stuff. What did the Brown University professor call it to? The soft racism of white liberalism or something like yeah, that? Something like Glenn has a lot of, um, Glenn has a lot of sharp, <laughs> Glenn has a lot of sharp words for the black establishment at Harvard. But again, I use the word soft porn and which is, you know, it's mm -hmm. a, it's a cutting, it's a cutting, but it's meant to be like so much of what you, it, again, that, that whole section you showed at the very beginning is me being nice, right? Like I watched, I, I had to, I had to watch lots and lots and lots of lectures from, you know, prominent tenured professors at Harvard university. And so much of it felt like a performance of black pain which of course there has been black pain in this kind like it's just, it's just, of course there has been but like at a certain point it, be, it it's just a performance for white people as opposed to trying to provide new insights to help fifth graders right now in 2022 finish high school mm -hmm. and graduate with some hard skills so they don't have to they aren't destined to a life of minimum wage drudgery what can we do right now we could talk about jim crow can talk about slavery, can talk about redlining. All those things happen in American history. Everybody should have to confront them. But at a certain point, if that's all you talk about, you be, the, the observer begins to suspect that you don't really care about solving the problem. You just care about soliciting pity. And Roland thought that way too, and he had no patience for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think too, something that, a point that you guys get across too about him and, and what he, he was after um, is that at least, at least people like him with his ideas should be validated as having had real experiences that could contribute to it. But what I got a sense of in your documentary is that it's not even like, yeah, well, we, we all talk about these things, but we just decided to go a different direction. It's almost like it's demeaned, like to say, even though you, you describe Roland Fryer as a guy who has been through it all, like he's seen it, he's been there. Uh, all the cards were stacked against him and he still rose to where he is um, that still he, he people would look at him and go, yeah, but that's, you know, that's just you, you know, that and, and, and almost sort of just, I think, infantilize his his experiences and overlook it as maybe just an oddity, not something that another person, you know, could do. And so it's not even like I said, like, it's like, yeah, OK, we'll I'll talk about these things, but I don't know, maybe we should go this other way. It almost still feels like it's devalued 
um, and 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 still like tossed aside as even like I don't know you were I hear people like you're just you know you're just fronting for the white guy or you're acting white like all that all that kind of stuff is still still around and so you don't even like some of us who would be really interested to hear from a guy like Roland Fryer if we went to Harvard. Um, I think you're there. Maybe there's this subtext that you shouldn't even listen to him because you like his ideas because you just have privilege. You know what I mean? Like you wouldn't right. like well, his ideas if you really got it. Yeah. Probably you, that's the, Roland's the last person you can level that accusation about because he comes from a maximally disadvantaged background. Yeah. And why is it that, um, I think, uh, again, there's, Roland's work is not about appeasing any particular partisan observer. It's never been about that. It's about digging up truth in order to operationalize it in public policy to actually impact positively the life of black people today. It's always been that way. I know it's weird for Rob Mons to be the person saying that, but it's true. But it's true. <laughs> it's um, not weird. <laughs> and as part of that, though, he just refuses to he refuses to um, self censor or mute or change the way that he was. And I mean, this is another. He is uh, when he was at Harvard again. He would wear. He would wear. Um, it was a big deal. I found this out. This is maybe a couple years before his cancellation. He'd go in, and he would host graduate student seminars, fresh from the gym after working out with the Harvard football team at six o'clock in the morning and he'd put on jerseys and sneakers and that's how he'd present to the Harvard graduate students, right? And it turned out that that presentation, physical presentation was an enormous scandal, right? And like, what's the big deal? Like, I, I, I don't care. Like if someone, it's like, not a big deal, but it's like, it, it's like Harvard in theory likes undomesticated, like raw, low income, pure capital B blackness. It likes it in theory, but when it actually confronts it in the seminar room, it feels kind of awkward about it. it yeah, it should say on the football field. Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like, wait, 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 not here. But in Roland's A is like, just his personality is such, he's like, I'm not changing. Mm -hmm. But also he wants to retain that energy, that transgressive energy that he doesn't want to forget where he came from. And he wants to continue to cultivate that bravery to ask these really complicated, provocative questions. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I guess the point I was trying to get across, which I've, I think I've formulated a little bit better is one might think that if you came across somebody like Roland with his background and what he was able to do and the ideas he's had and what he's wants to, what he wants to do with those ideas that you would say, wow, like teach us, you know what I mean? <laughs> teach us because like you made it and you've got these interesting ideas and we should listen to the outlier. But it seems like there's, pressure to write off that person that you would say it, it just seems like they're that that's still in academia and and it really like some of the stuff that you guys describe it it's like instead of being excited to find somebody like roland um there's there's a there's there's still almost a pressure to like look in the opposite direction like oh, yeah either well he just got lucky or he's just, like I said, like he, you know, if you like him, it's just because he makes you feel comfortable about, you know, whatever position you already have. He doesn't want to really face the truth or I don't know. I mean, it just seems odd to me. You wouldn't look at a guy like him and say, maybe we should give this guy a shot. I mean, he's, he's, he's really made it, you know, despite tough circumstances, like maybe he's got something to add instead of going, uh, I don't know. Come on. You know, that's not how it works in the real world you know you got lucky and and just sort of just write the guy off that that's just the sense i i get yeah. you know about 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 a person like him not just him specifically so yeah. okay real fast too it broke my heart to watch this video i worked with black first graders in an inner city school so many of them had untapped intelligence if you could open that door they could fly lowering standards for black students is pure condescension and blaming racism for everything is an insult to black children why is this so threatening to so many people? It's pure common sense. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. And then this final question, the real question is how many others have they done this to and how many never got hired because they didn't fit in? So those are the final closing questions and thoughts. Any Anything you'd like to respond to? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just think, um, I mean, you know, we get into it. 
it, it's it, it just turned out that a lot of the more powerful people at Harvard University are more concerned with the maintenance of a very particular political ideology than improving the the concrete circumstances of a lot of disadvantaged people. That they it's it's much more important to them to retain a particular narrative, a particular like politically correct narrative, than to actually make a difference in the. It's like they. They, 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 they want to maintain this narrative that gives them a level of comfort. And if you're black, it gives you a, a, an elevated social status in Cambridge. It's more important to retain that system than to help like the lost boys and girls of Houston. And that's a very depressing realization to make. And I'm not, I don't necessarily want to pretend that there's any redemption in this other than just Roland is, an absolutely exceptional person and he hasn't stopped the fight just because Harvard assassinated his career. Okay. Before I ask you my final, final question, um, I just want to ask everybody real fast. Who's in the YouTube chat, or if you're watching this later on YouTube, I get this all the time. Why don't I ever get notifications? She has been shadow banned. Can you let me know if you were unsubscribed or you don't get notifications or whatever? Because I am trying to figure out what's going on with my my channel. And I think focusing on censored people does not help <laughs> because their ideas are typically not the ones YouTube wants to promote. So I'm not really quite sure where I sit with them. But yeah, let me know if you've had some kind of weird experience like that. Another person was talking about how NYU is a private research university. So thank you for the, the check on that. I forgot. It is private. Okay. So... If, if that's the truth, like, if, or at least that's the the truth, the way you, you see it and the way the documentary definitely sees it, um, that, that there's the, the priorities of actually fixing things are way out of whack. What is actually, what is be, what is at heart being protected, I guess, at, at the consequence of not, of not moving forward um, and do you, what do you think the people who you criticize in the documentary think about it and think about your documentary? I mean, have you heard from any of them? Because <laughs> like they, I, I, I'm just going to take a guess that they sleep pretty well at night. They're not sitting here thinking I, this is again, a guess. I, hey, I just don't care about black kids. I don't care about education. I just want to preserve my narrative because I make a lot of money off of it. I think these people are true believers. And so in their mind, they probably look at your documentary think it's extremely biased and I don't know, quackery maybe. And that they like they're yeah. they would, you know, and just they they would never see themselves as as just trying to protect some kind of narrative at the at the cost of the people they feel like they're really there to save. I I think they probably have a a, a a savior complex of some kind. So what do you what do you think is really being protected and 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 what what do you think they they really think to themselves? And and what would you know your guess on their reaction or have you heard from any of them? I have not heard from them. I did lovingly put in interview requests with both Claudine Gay and Larry Bobo. Shockingly enough, I was turned down on both accounts. I don't know what they think, Allison. I mean, I get in trouble whenever I get prompted like this to discuss these people because I have so much hatred in my heart for them. I, I mean, I'm just like, I just think a lot of these people, like, don't let the, don't let the prestige blind you. There's a lot of pampered mediocrity up in media at Harvard. There is. Because you can get real far if you regurgitate on command the, the, the idea, the, the, the beliefs that are expected of you. That's white, black, whatever. If you're black, it's like you can you can get particularly far. You can be clotting gay and have a tiny ass CV and barely any academic accomplishments, and you can get rocket boosted to the very top of the Harvard administration because you fit the right demographic categories and you and you have the right politics. And you're essentially non-threatening and you advance precisely the political narrative that is um, most welcome at Harvard University. I don't know. I mean, I just think a lot of them have gotten weak. It's like victories defeated them. Like they're just quite, I've watched a lot of, I mean, I, I, I have consumed, I've consumed the, the bodies of work of both of these completely mediocre scholars and they're just not particularly impressive people. They just aren't. And I just don't think that they're capable I think you're not particularly impressive. And also if you've spent a lot of time in the academy and you're so infrequently challenged, you never have been even given the opportunity to build those muscles of how you would actually critically respond to a piece of a piece like this. Cause you just don't get challenged that much. This is part of what like the problem with political homogeneity in these institutions is just generally that 
the idea with the university is that it's a very aggressive competition between conflicting points of view. And it's in that conflict that truth emerges. But once you get, once it becomes politically homogenous and everybody begins to agree, there is that that friction goes away. And that friction is, is what was birthing the new truths. And, and instead people just get away with reciting the same tired, trite lines without ever being challenged. And a lot of the people that are in powerful positions at Harvard University have only ever existed within that complementary milieu. I very rarely actually had to, in a rigorous fashion, engage with opposing positions. Um, like none of them have had to debate Glenn Lowry. <laughs> they haven't. It would not right. go well for them if they did. But, but they I haven't had to debate Glenn that. Lowry. I would pay to see that. I'm going to play yeah. the end of your documentary and then we'll finish up. I think we got 30 seconds or 40 seconds here. Let me know if you can't hear it. When I first got to Harvard, people would say to me, hey, man, how does it feel to beat the odds? And that would really piss me off because it's not about beating the odds. It's about changing the odds. So I guess I'm just trying to make the journey worth it, to be honest with you. That was a fire last quote. I love it. Um, it's not about beating the odds. It's about changing the odds. Rob, any final closing thoughts you'd like to share? Everybody go over to your YouTube channel. Um, and I'll show it one more time just to make sure people know where to go. Good Kid Productions. And the film name is Harvard Canceled. It's Best Black Professor Why. Uh, Rob Muntz put it all together. He's going to come back on when he exposes propaganda in the media. <laughs> or uh, he'll bring his rabbits and show us how to have a farm with rabbits <laughs> on it. I well, I mean, any, any kind of content you guys need. I mean, I can't say I'm the riot. But my, my wife has, has purchased not one but two different meat rabbit mogul manuals so she she has plans and i just do whatever my wife asks of me if that's <laughs> if that's a hot topic that your audience would like to have some insights and in, i'm happy to provide it. i have a second channel and i should just shout it out because if people watching want to go subscribe it's off gridish living i'll put it in the chat off gridish so o-f-f-g-r-i-d-i-s-h-l-i-v-i-n-g off gridish living you guys i would love to have you come on that channel and talk about your lifestyle and what you're doing and the homesteading thing and all that stuff. So, yeah. So let's do that. Let's put <laughs> that together. My wife, not me. Okay. Not well, me. Like, ask her and tell her to bring a couple <laughs> rabbits and just hold them like this during the whole, no, people will get mad at me if I, if we did that, but or she can hold them like this. She can hold them like this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Rob Munz, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate your taking the time and thank you everybody for watching. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it.